Fusion Retro Books have kindly offered a 20% discount to all our MC viewers on The Story of the Oliver Twins. It's a great book, this is my well-thumbed copy here, so do check it out. Now, on with the tea break. We're joined for our tea break today by Philip Oliver, one half of the Oliver Twins, who together were one of the most prolific game creators of the 80s. In fact, I think you might even be in the Guinness Book of Records as the most prolific 8-bit games creator of the 80s. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, uh, that's good, Neil. <laughs> you were known for games like the Dizzy series, of course, BMX and other simulator titles, Ghostbusters 2 and a lot more. Philip, thank you for joining us today with your chosen you. topic, which is how and why we made 8-bit games. And perhaps as a frame of reference, you can tell us what was the first game that you published, and then we can work out how you got there and, and beyond. Yeah, cool. Um, I guess published officially is a type in listing. Uh, it was in computer and video games in December 83. Uh, it was called Roadrunner uh, for the Dragon 32. Um, written in basic. Um, it was not many lines of code. Uh, thinking back, it must have been like 50 or 60 lines of code. We wanted to keep it fairly short because whenever we looked at listings in magazines, they look crazy long to type in. And you just like, who's going to do that? I mean, even we were pretty hardcore and even we kind of looked at some of these listings and go, <laughs> I don't think that's too long. So we wanted to keep it really short. Um, and what it was, was um, just blocks. Uh, it's like a top down racing game. Um, and it procedurally generated a road in front of you that was all wiggly. You had the car at the bottom and you had to steer the car left and right to kind of keep it on the road and avoid the obstacles. So what, what year was this published in? Uh, December 83 it was published. Yeah. I actually believe that we wrote it almost a year earlier. Uh, it took them that long to decide to uh, decide and then publish it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it took them a year, which was like just crazy. Yeah. Made a big difference when we went uh, along to Code Masters and we were giving them games. And the next week you'd see them on the shelves in Smith's. I mean, they had an amazing turnaround time. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll come on to Code Masters. I know um, that particular game, you didn't have a printer at home, did you, to send it into oh, TMVG? Oh, no. <laughs> so you got your mum yeah. to type it out. <laughs> well, yeah, it seemed a really sensible idea. I went to the, um, the, the local college and she had an electronic typewriter. I say electronic typewriter, uh, uh, just a regular typewriter. Um, electronic in the fact that the keyboard's depressed properly. You didn't actually have to throw the arm up. It had like a daisy wheel. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we uh, hand wrote the printout uh, and gave it to her and said, please type that in. And then we would review it, uh, make sure there weren't any typos. And of course, she didn't know code. Uh, so there were loads of typos always. <laughs> Um, and then eventually when there was a clean enough copy and, and the problem was she, she couldn't edit it. She just had to retype it completely. It's like, mum, there's three errors. This one, this one, this one. Got to retype it from scratch. Uh, so she had to do that quite a few times. Eventually we managed to get a bug free version. Luckily photocopiers did exist. So um, we photocopied it a few times, sent it off to the people, uh, computer and video games. They eventually decided to publish it, did publish it. And it was only several years later Somebody said to us, why didn't you send them a cassette? <laughs> Hindsight it's is like, wonderful. They man. will have a printer and it will <laughs> save them typing it back in. Do you know what? We never thought about it. And it was only a couple of years later that somebody mentioned it, which is like, why did we think of that? It's yeah. uh, but hey, so I when in it, the magazine, did you get yeah. any opportunities uh, come about as a direct result then of that being published? No, not really. Um, that's... No, nothing really progressed with that. But um, because they took about a year to progress it, we'd actually um, won the TV competition, the Saturday show. Uh, by this time, we'd actually moved on from a Dragon 32 to a BBC Micro, mm -hmm. which I believe we swapped around the end of 82, which is why we know the Dragon 32 listing took about a year to publish, because we didn't even have a Dragon by the time it got published. Oh, well. Because <laughs> uh, we traded it in. Uh, we traded the, the Dragon in against the BBC Micro uh, because they were expensive computers. The Dragon was £200. The BBC Micro was £400. Mm. Uh, in today's money, £400 is about £1,200. Yeah. Um, we're school kids. I mean, we were 13, 14 or something. Uh, so, yeah, this was really expensive. And you were so spending we this money, were you, with the intention to write games? Um, I guess what actually happened was... Um, we first saw, well, 
a friend had a Apple IIe and we got really addicted and hooked on. I shouldn't use the word addicted. Uh, we were enthralled by and entertained by phenomenal games on his dad's Apple IIe, which was an even more expensive computer, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, he was a science teacher at the local college. Um, and uh, we got um, enthralled by that and we wanted to have our own computer. Um, we did a paper round, um, saved up loads of money to buy the Dragon 32. Our brother bought a ZX81 um, whilst we were saving, and we had a play with it, and it was absolutely rubbish. But but it did convince us that actually that's why we needed a Dragon 32, um, because the Dragon 32 it had a good spec, 32K of memory, uh, 16 colours, a, a keyboard that worked. Um, it was a nice piece of kit compared with the ZX81. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what uh, really got us into wanting to own a computer and play games. But the minute you had the Dragon 32, there were several things came up. One, it was pretty easy to program, which is great because it has a great built-in basic. It even had sprites uh, in the basic. It had a great manual. Um, and it was really interesting and, uh, to play around and make games. But also, the Dragon 32 was not a popular computer, so it had very few games available in the shops, um, which kind of forced us to have to sort of make our own entertainment. There were a few games, but you got tired of them pretty quick. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we actually started sort of making our own games. And then we just really got the bug of making games and wanted to make better games. But then we found that if we make better games, nobody cares, because so few people have a Dragon 32, uh, then nobody cared. So that's when we thought we've got to get a BBC Micro. These are awesome machines. Uh, it's a huge, huge investment. Um, I say investment. It was our parents kind of loaned us the money and we had to do loads and loads of kind of odd jobs around the house to sort of to cross. We had a big spreadsheet on the wall, like uh, a list of tasks. It was like tidy bedroom will get earn you sort of 50p. Uh, doing the washing up will earn you 75p. And we basically had a big chart. It was like a darts board where you're just crossing the numbers off and the number just comes down until you get to zero. And, and it took about a year to get down to zero of lots of little odd jobs, mow the lawn, take the dog for a walk. That was only about 10p. Wow, that's dedication. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But ultimately, when you got to the bottom of that list, the choice yeah. of a BBC Micro, was that your choice? Oh, no, it? no, because oh, they advanced us the money because oh, okay. uh, so they could see our frustration um, and we told them our frustration that we we really got the bug from wanting to make games and program, but almost instantly we just hit this um, block, this uh, wall that nobody cared that we would like because you were work, working on the on the Dragon 32 and also our mum working at the local college she spoke to the computer science teacher there and actually said look this is the problem the lads have got they're asking for a BBC micro and he's like oh yeah 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 if they want to go into technology in the future this is what they have to learn Dragon 32 it's an okay hobby machine but if they've really got the bug for this then yeah it is worth it so so he reassured them um, that it was worth them advancing us the money to go and buy the computer sure. and trade and trade the thirty two with the, the dragon in. Um, sure, but I'm sure the computer science teacher wasn't thinking from the perspective of this would be a good machine to make games on. He was more thinking. No, absolutely not. Yeah. In fact, this is the very same computer studies teacher who, a couple of years later, was my computer studies teacher and um, wrote on my report card, which I still have a copy of. And in fact, there's a copy in the book, uh, the Oliver Twins book which actually says that um, Philip should spend less time trying to engineer all all exercise and tasks to uh, being about games and graphics. <laughs> Didn't succeed in that one, I'm afraid. No, not at all, not at all. <laughs> you moved on after the BBC, I know, to the Amstrad CPC, I think it was the 6128 that you had. Um, is that 64 correct? 64, we started with. We, we, we managed to get the 64, which was uh, the first one with a disk drive, which was really good, and that was in about 85, I believe. Oh, and, the reason, yeah. and the reason we moved on to that is because um, although we managed to get really good at programming the BBC, and initially in BASIC, but then learning uh, Assembler, that was 6502, we started making some games, but we were sort of a bit late to the market. Aconsoft produced some amazing games, um, and they pr priced them at about ten pounds. And we were coming up with games which were they're okay, but they were no nothing in comparison to the quality that Aconsoft was able to put out. And there was no budget market on a on a. The BBC Micro. So, so basically, we just couldn't get our games published. Uh, so we went to um, uh, 
Firebird, uh, that was actually a division of British Telecom, which was, believe it or not, it seems crazy they would get involved in computer games, but they did. Um, and they encouraged us, so we wrote um, Easy Art for them, which was an art package, which they actually never published. They paid for, but they never published. Um, and then we wrote a Sprite package for them, uh, which is Sprites Plus, which was also never published and also never paid for. But whilst writing that, they said, look, guys, you're on the wrong machine now, BBC Micro. We just can't sell games on the BBC anymore. Um, but this, um, the, the Amstrad's doing quite well in the market. There aren't an awful lot of games. And there's a 664 about to be released. And because we're a publisher, we can get you some early machines. Um, so we got some very early 664s. And we thought, I say we got some. Uh, they actually said, how many do you want? And we said three with the idea that we'd sell a couple on to funds. <laughs> well, because if, if you've got an inroad to a new machine that's coming out, uh, so that's exactly what we did do. So we actually uh, got three off British Telecom and then kind of sold them on. Uh, we didn't make profit along the way. I get the sense that your, your business brain switched on quite early on in life to be thinking uh, Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. I'd say we're pretty entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, yeah, absolutely. So it was in November 1986, if we jump forward a bit now, when Super Robin Hood came out. Sure. Um, was that a significant release for you? Absolutely. Mm. So what had actually happened in the, in that kind of time frame and before the Robin Hood, and I'll, I'll finish with Robin Hood, don't worry, <laughs> um, is that we really got to grips with the, uh, the Amstrad um, 664, although obviously... Um, the games were compatible across all Amstrads. Um, we made the Art Easy Art, we made the Panda Sprites, the Sprites Plus renamed, and then we started banging out loads and loads of games. And at this point, there was a market for Amstrad games um, at budget because our, the games quality that we were doing were not amazing. Um, so we actually uh, approached the budget um, publishers like yeah, Mastertronics, um, Players, and a few others. I can't think of what the others were called now. Um, anyway, and we managed to get publishing deals. We managed to get all our games published, but we didn't actually get very much money for them. And when I say not much money, I mean, we're talking sort of £100, £200. And we knew that the quality of the games and the volume of sales, it should be much better than this. So um, this was during our sixth form. And we didn't really want to go to university uh, because there weren't any games courses or anything. And that's what we wanted to do was make games. Uh, we'd have had to, I think I, I, I was down for doing electronic engineering or something um, at a place called Shrivenham University is where I was going to be going. It was going to be nice because I was actually getting paid um, by British Aerospace. I actually had been offered a, a, a salary. So university back then was free and I was offered a uh, sponsorship by British Aerospace to go there and take a £12,000 salary for going to university for three years. So I did actually turn that down because uh, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to study electronic engineering. Um, but the um, but the way we got out of not going to university was to convince our parents we were just going to take a year out. <laughs> uh, uh, we're just going to try this, and um, our the uh, head of sixth form uh, convinced our parents look, let them get them out of their system. It will be a good experience um, doing this, and. Um, then they can go to university next year. So we put the university off, wrote a nice little letter, said, we'll see you next year. And that was fine. Um, but then our dad made the throwaway comment, uh, which was, you won't have to go to university if you can earn more money than me in your first year. Which, he, it was a throwaway comment from his point of view, but from ours, that was a challenge. That was right, right, we've got to knuckle down, we've got to make some money. So during that summer holiday, so we just left school, we just finished A-levels, We've got to focus now more on the money. And if we keep earning like 200 quid per game that we make, that's not going to be good enough. So we set ourselves a target of a game a month. And uh, we had to drive the numbers up, drive the money up. So we did some research as to what sells. And we found Ghostbusters, um, the game, was the biggest selling game at the time. Um, so we decided that we needed a license because that's obviously what we're selling it, we figured, because if you look at the game, we, we weren't too impressed by the game quality. So we figured it was the name that was selling it. So we had to come up with a good name. So we decided we can't buy licenses. We would have to go and find a free license out there. And we came up with the idea of, of Robin Hood. 
to kind of make it our own and to just sort of this isn't just a regular Robin Hood. We we use the word super in front of it. <laughs> Interesting because <laughs> Miyamoto was doing exactly the same back with Mario at the time. He was, because, he was, yeah. And it was exactly the same period, but we didn't know what each other were doing. In fact, we didn't see Super Mario until three or four years later. Anyway, um, so what happened was we went to a trade show, decided to go around and actually say, look, we've got this new game idea. It's called Super Robin Hood. Uh, how much would you pay for it? We published all these games. It's not like we can't make this. Here's roughly what the concept is. And when we met, um, so we went around uh, several publishers, um, it leads to Mastertronic and Ocean, US Gold, all of these kind of guys. And uh, most of them didn't take us seriously. But the Darlings, they were just starting Codemasters. They had a little stand there, a table, a couple of chairs, some posters. And there were two guys, similar to age to us. We got chatting to them, showed them what we had and said, um, well, what would you pay if we made this game for Codemasters? And David Darling said, £10,000. Wow. It's like, wow, we're going to make this in a month. We've already said that we can, we can do this in a month. So we're like, this is crazy. So we're like, right, we're, we're on, we'll do this. And pretty much we stopped talking to all the other games companies then. <laughs> we just got straight back in the car, drove home, um, and started making it. And a month later, delivered it back to Codemasters, a week later, they had it in the shops. It was crazy turnaround times, and the game went straight to number one. Um, and there was a little bit of a discrepancy on the £10,000. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, as David put it, an estimate of what you may earn. Actually, because the game did so successfully, it in fact earned more. But when we actually turned up at Codemasters, there was the... Uh, well, no, we're not giving you £10,000 now. We're just going to sign a contract with you now to pay you royalties. And, uh, and it was 10 pence a unit, I think it was. And we were a bit disappointed. But he said, look, I'll, I'll cut you a check here and now, £2,000 advance. Well, we'd been getting £200 per previous game. And this was an advance, so surely it should be even more than that. And actually, true to their word, it turned out really well. Super Robin Hood did spectacularly. And that started a very long um, career of us making games yeah. and for Codemasters. Yeah. Well, Philip, I'm afraid our 15 minutes is, is oh, no. well overdue. But I think that's a really great place. It'll have to be a part two now. Uh, well, that's a really great place to stop because we will be speaking to Andrew next week. So that would be a great place for him to pick up the story and tell us that's the next incredible. chapter of the Oliver Twins. So thank you very much for your time today and uh, take care. Right, cheers, Neil. Thank you. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.